Dear friends and family in Christ, may the Lord give you faith, not by sight, but faith in your hearts, knowing that he has risen, and you too shall rise. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, gracious God, we give thanks to you for sending us your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for his precious sufferings and death, for his resurrection from the grave. Help us each day to celebrate the resurrection in our lives, to know that each day is a reminder that you, that you are in control, that you live, that we too shall one day live more fully. Until that day comes, may you always lead us, guide us, and direct us, not by knowledge, but by faith alone. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On February 4th, some of you may have seen it, there was a debate, and it was hosted at the Creation Museum. It was hosted between uh, Ken Ham, who is the president of the Creation Museum, and then Bill Nye. You may recognize that name. He was on TV for a little while, and he was called Bill Nye the Science Guy. And he was representing the evolutionist view, while Ken Ham was representing the creationist view. Ken Ham believed that creation happened in six days, as Scripture tells us, six 24-hour days. On the other hand, Bill Nye suggests that the world was created over billions of years as the universe expanded over time. And he, again, he does not believe in creation, but evolution. Well, I don't know if any of you saw the debate, but the debate was less than interesting, to be honest with you. And if you did watch it, then you realize that probably no one changed sides. In fact, if you were sitting on the fence when you started watching the debate, you were probably sitting on the fence when you finished watching the debate. But the reason I bring up the debate is because there, each of the two debatees were asked a question. What, if anything, would ever change your mind? Tom answered immediately. He didn't even have to think about it. He said, I would never change my mind. My faith is in what the Bible says. This is what God says, so this is what I believe. Bill Nye answered, well, if there was one shred of evidence, one piece of proof, one cold, hard, empirical piece of evidence, he would change his mind. In fact, throughout the debate, he suggested that if there was a fossil out of place in the fossil record, well, that would change his mind. If we could prove that the universe was not expanding, but only appeared to be doing so, he would change his mind. If the stars in the heavens were a lot closer than they seemed, he would change his mind. One shred of cold, hard evidence. That's all that he demands. That's all that many in the community of the scientific community, the evolutionary community, demands. One whole cold, hard piece of truth. Many people say if they had that piece of truth, they would change their beliefs. They would believe in God and immediately things would change for them. But I don't think that it's just those outside of the, outside of the Christian community who sometimes struggle with the miracles of the Bible. Because that, after all, is what nigh, what many in the scientific community struggle with. They struggle with wrapping their minds around the idea of our world created in six days, six 24-hour days. They wrap their minds, they have trouble wrapping their minds around the idea that Christ could be present in body, in bread and wine, his whole body and blood. They have trouble wrapping their minds around the idea that Christ could raise be risen from the grave. Many Christians also struggle with these truths. They hear these truths of, of the word, and they look at these truths, and they know that the, what the, they've heard pastors say. They've read what they've read in God's holy word, but they struggle to wrap their minds around them. Maybe some of you have had science professors, have had teachers throughout your days, and whether it be all the way from grade school to high school to college, who told you some pretty plausible responses to creation. Maybe you've heard them say things that, that seem to make sense, that you can wrap your mind around. Anybody? Most of us have. We've had teachers and professors who have to taught us these theories that make sense. And what is the church's response? Much like Ken Ham's, we say, well, we believe because it's in God's word. And people sometimes struggle with that. But that's kind of what John said at the end of our gospel reading for today. 
I encourage you to turn now to John 20 again and, and look at John's words to us. Notice what John says. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. These things are written so that we may believe. These things are written so that we may have life, so that we may have faith. But these words were not written in a vacuum. These words were not written by themselves, but written in the context of the rest of John's gospel. And that is an important truth. We'll come back to it in just a moment. But I think a lot of times we like to look at that and say, well, see, it's all a matter of facts. It's all a matter of things that we can line up and prove. Many apologists will talk about how you can prove the Christian faith. And while it is true that you can prove many of the things that have happened in Scripture, it is impossible to prove faith. Faith is not empirical. Faith cannot be measured. Faith is not something that you can chart or that you can demonstrate. Faith is something that the Holy Spirit works in our hearts. Faith is created in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Faith isn't about memorizing the words of Scripture. It isn't about memorizing every last detail of when the king, what kings were living in the Old Testament, knowing the very facts of the resurrection. But faith is believing the truth, regardless of whether or not it can be measured or even makes sense or we can wrap our minds around it. Because that is what faith is. Faith is the work of the Holy Spirit in us to trust in God, to be assured in God whether or not we can make sense of the situation. And this is very important because a lot of Christians are content to equate faith to fact. And faith and fact are not equal. Faith supersedes our understanding of fact. This isn't to say that Scripture is wrong. In fact, you've heard me say, and I'll say it again, and stand on the truth of Scripture. And it's very important that we know Scripture. Isn't that John's point today? But Scripture alone does not produce faith. But faith through Scripture, but the Holy Spirit working through Scripture produces faith. And that's why there are those who can know the Bible backwards and forwards. Even the demons know that there is a God. Even the demons know that God exists. But that is not counted as faith, is it? No, faith is the work of the Spirit. Sometimes I think it's easier for us to accept this idea that faith is simply knowledge. Because we can wrap our minds around that. We can get in control of that. We can put that in our court, and that's exactly what Ken Ham, if you listen to the debate, was doing. He wasn't talking about faith as something beyond the Word of God, as something the Spirit was doing, but he talked about his faith just in the Word. It has to be more than that. Faith has to be that complete trust and assurance in God. Because if it's not, it leads to unbelief, and it leads to death. Now when we read John chapter 20, we realize even John made this point. He was making the point, even though he was talking about knowing, needing to know Scripture, needing to know the truth of God's Word, he was not leaving it alone there. Notice if you read the rest of John chapter 20, and start back at, chap at, the, at verse 1 where we started last week. You'll notice that the disciples, they had all the facts. Mary, she had all the facts. Many of the teachers of the law, they had all the facts. But the facts didn't produce faith, did it? What happened after they witnessed the crucifixion, after they witnessed death? They thought it was the end. You know, we, we tend to pick on Thomas, but really, weren't the other disciples, wasn't Mary, weren't they also struggling with belief, with faith? And it wasn't that Jesus was a bad teacher. He had warned them that it was coming. Just go to Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 16, there's this discussion between Jesus and Peter. And first you have Peter who proclaims that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then you have Peter telling Jesus, oh no, you mustn't die and you mustn't. You won't be put to death. And that's where that famous line, get behind me, Satan, comes from. Because although the disciples knew the facts, 
They struggled with that faith aspect. They struggled at the foot of the cross to understand how Jesus could use this. They, they, they struggled to wrap their mind around how someone could rise from the grave when they'd seen Jesus do it before, raise others, but no one had ever done it themselves. Faith is more than fact. Faith is more than knowledge. It is the devil's deception that is just a pile of knowledge. Because it's easy to believe that there is a God. It's much different to believe in God. I know it's just a simple preposition, right? But that preposition means everything. Because faith in God is a daily walk with God. We don't talk about a faith stop, but a daily walk with God. And a daily need for the Holy Spirit to war work in our hearts. A daily need for the Holy Spirit to lead us back to the waters of our baptism. To remind us of the promise that Christ gave to us. To remind us that we are sinners in need of forgiveness in need of the resurrection promise. Thomas, although we tend to pick on him, you know, it seems like we have a lot in common with him. I don't think it's an accident that Thomas is called Didymus or twin. Because how many of us are twins to Thomas? How many of us, when our lives are not going as we planned, how many of us, when, our li when it doesn't seem like God is listening, how many of us, when our loved ones are taken, when we see death all around us, atrocities done to people, to, to children and women, how many of us struggle with our faith? How many re of us wrestle with whether or not God is in control when we see these things happening? We may pick on Thomas, but really, we are twins to him, aren't we? We struggle at times. And that's why faith is not what we do. But it is a gift of the Spirit. Earlier in John, John reminds us, Jesus tells us, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That rebirth through baptism the gift of faith given to us in our baptism. And then again, Jesus echoes these words in John chapter 20. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And while that verse has a lot of doctrinal impact for us, most important to us is the fact that Jesus gave the disciples. The fact that he gives to us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who drives us to the cross. Who drives us to the foot of the cross where we see our sins paid for. The need for our sins forgiven. It is the Holy Spirit who leads us to that empty tomb. To see that Christ has indeed risen. And it is the Holy Spirit who continues to sustain our faith each day. He did not merely create our faith and our baptism and leave us here to flounder about. But He is with us each day. And He is the one who is leading us to stop unbelieving, but believe. Thomas, he, he was a doubter. But more than that, he was an unbeliever. Until he jabbed his hand into the nail holes, into the side of Christ. But Jesus says to us, blessed are you. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. God has given us this blessing. The blessing that the Spirit will lead us to the forgiveness of sins. The blessing that the Spirit will lead us to that promise of salvation. The blessing that no matter how many facts we learn, no matter how many facts we know or don't know, that faith is that gift. And so when you think about faith as a gift, you realize that it's not so hard to wrap your mind around those things that don't always make sense empirically, that can't be measured. When we think about faith as a gift from God, if God tells us six days creation, then we know it is His truth. If God tells us that He can be present in bread and wine, 
Why should we doubt him? If he tells us that he rose from the grave and that he too will one day raise each of us, what greater hope do we have than that? That is the gift of faith at work by the Holy Spirit in us. That is the gift of faith at work when we share those truths with others. Because it's not about how much you know. It's not about trying to convince someone to believe in your God. It's about planting those seeds and seeing how the Holy Spirit will work. Watching how the Spirit will, will, will water and, and fertilize and grow those seeds of faith after you've planted them. That's why we don't have to be afraid about sharing this faith. That's why we don't have to be afraid about whether or not we have all the details right or if whether or not we, we can defend creation because we point them to that gift of the Spirit. We point them to that promise, that hope, that one day we all shall rise. Those who believe in and baptize shall be raised. So stop unbelieving and believe. Believe boldly and share that faith that the Spirit is working within you. Amen. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you move and breathe among us. We thank you that you have come among us and that you have that you continue to, as you have created the faith in our hearts, that you continue to sustain it each day. Forgive us for those times when we turn to facts, when we turn to trying to prove that which we cannot. Instead, help us always remember that your word is truth, that your promise through faith will always sustain us. Forgive us for those times when we get caught up in the things of this world, the hate and the bitterness, the atrocities and the shame. Return us again to you. Restore us. Lead us so that we would not be unbelieving, but believe. Believe that Christ has risen and that we too shall rise. And so we say together joyfully, Alleluia, Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia, Amen.